shall not God avenge his own? Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 8 There was in a city, he said, a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. The judge who is here pictured had no regard for right, nor pity for suffering. The widow who pressed her case before him was persistently repulsed. Again and again she came to him only to be treated with contempt and to be driven from the judgment seat. The judge knew that her case was righteous and he could have relieved her at once, but he would not. He wanted to show his arbitrary power, and it gratified him to let her ask and plead and entreat in vain. But she would not fail nor become discouraged. Notwithstanding his indifference and hard-heartedness, she pressed her petition until the judge consented to attend to her case. Though I fear not God, nor regard man, he said, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, least by her continual coming she weary me. To save his reputation, to avoid giving publicity to his partial one-sided judgment, he avenged the persevering woman. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. Here Christ draws a sharp contrast between the unjust judge and God. The judge yielded to the woman's request merely through selfishness, that he might be relieved of her importunity. He felt for her no pity, or compassion, her misery was nothing to him. How different is the attitude of God towards those who seek him? The appeals of the needy and the distressed are considered by him with infinite compassion. The woman who entreated the judge for justice had lost her husband by death. Poor and friendless, she had no means of retrieving her ruined fortunes. So by sin, man lost his connection with God. Of himself, he has no means of salvation. But in Christ, 
we are brought nigh unto the Father. The elect of God are dear to his heart. They are those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, to show forth his praise, to shine as lights amid the darkness of the world. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 9 and 10. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 The widow's prayer, Avenge me, do me justice, of mine adversary represents the prayer of God's children. Satan is their great adversary. He is the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God day and night. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. He is continually working to misrepresent and accuse to deceive and destroy the people of God. And it is for deliverance from the power of Satan and his agents that in this parable Christ teaches his disciples to pray. In the prophecy of Zechariah is brought to view Satan's accusing work and the work of Christ in resisting the adversary of his people. The prophet says, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. The people of God are here represented as a criminal on trial. Joshua, as high priest, is seeking for a blessing for his people who are in great affliction. While he is pleading before God, Satan is standing at his right hand as his adversary. He is accusing the children of God and making their case appear as desperate as possible. He presents before the Lord their evil doings and their defects. He shows their faults and failures, hoping they will appear of such a character in the eyes of Christ that he will render them no help in their great need. Joshua, as the representative of God's people, stands under condemnation, clothed with filthy garments. Aware of the sins of his people, he is weighted down with discouragement. Satan is pressing upon his soul a sense of guiltiness that makes him feel almost hopeless. Yet, there he stands, a suppliant, with Satan arrayed against him. The work of Satan as an accuser began in heaven. This has been his work on earth ever since man's fall, and it will be his work in a special sense 
as we approach nearer to the close of this world's history. As he sees that his time is short, he will work with greater earnestness to deceive and destroy. He is angry when he sees a people on the earth who, even in their weaknesses and sinfulness, have respect to the law of Jehovah. He is determined that they shall not obey God. Every manifestation of God's power for his people arouses the enmity of Satan. Every time God works in their behalf, Satan with his angels works with renewed vigor to compass their ruin. He is jealous of all who make Christ their strength. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield fully to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. The Lord's people cannot of themselves answer the charges of Satan. As they look to themselves, they are ready to despair. But they appeal to the divine advocate. They plead the merits of the Redeemer. God can be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 26. With confidence the Lord's children cry unto him to silence the accusations of Satan and bring to naught his devices. Do me justice of mine adversary, they pray, and with the mighty argument of the cross, Christ silences the bold accuser. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with garments. Then with the authority of the Lord, the host of the angel made a solemn pledge to Joshua, the representative of God's people. If thou will walk in my ways, and if thou will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, even among the angels that surround the throne of God. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 3 through 7 Notwithstanding the defects of the people of God, Christ does not turn away from the object of his care. He has the power to change their raiment. He removes the filthy garments. He places upon the repenting, believing ones his own robe of righteousness and writes pardon against their names on the records of heaven. He confesses them as his before the heavenly universe. Satan, their adversary, is shown to be an accuser and deceiver. God will do justice for his own elect. The Prayer do me justice of mine adversary, 
applies not only to Satan, but to the agencies whom he instigates to misrepresent, to tempt, and to destroy the people of God. The character of the judge in the parable, who feared not God nor regarded man, was presented by Christ to show the kind of judgment that was then being executed and that would soon be witnessed at his trial. He desires his people in all time to realize how little dependence can be placed on the earthly rulers or judges in the day of adversity. In the parable of the unjust judge, Christ has shown what we should do. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Christ, our example, did nothing to vindicate or deliver himself. He committed his case to God. So his followers are not to accuse or condemn, nor to resort to force in order to deliver themselves. While the world is progressing in wickedness, none of us need flatter ourselves that we shall have no difficulties. But it is in these very difficulties that bring us into the audience chamber of the Most High. We may seek counsel of one who is infinite in wisdom. The Lord says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. Psalm 50 verse 15 if we surrender our lives to His service, we can never be placed in a position for which God has not made provision. Whatever may be our situations, we have a guide to direct our way. Whatever our perplexities, we have a sure counselor. Whatever our sorrow, bereavement, or loneliness, we have a sympathizing friend. If in our ignorance we make missteps, Christ does not leave us. His voice, clear and distinct, is heard saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. You who feel the most unworthy, Fear not to commit your case to God. When he gave himself in Christ for the sin of the world, he undertook the case of every soul. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his heritage from the dominion of Satan. But before we are delivered from Satan's power without, we must be delivered from his power within. Shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Hebrews chapter 10, 
verses 35 through 37. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. The world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in opposition and cruelty towards his heritage, saying, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Psalm 73, verse 11. But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. Even now, they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long-suffering of God, the limits of His grace, the limits of His mercy. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Whatever crosses they have been called to bear, whatever losses they have sustained, whatever persecution they have suffered, even to the loss of their temporal life, the children of God are amply recompensed. They shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Thank you, and God bless. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 66 to 73, Ellen G. White.